Barbara Lipford, in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in Him, I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of His death, raised for new life in Christ Amen. Jesus. Father's God to thee, Father. 
case you didn't notice, the 4th of July is coming up, so we've sung some songs for you this morning. I remember, I'm so old, I remember singing yep. my, co hush, my Country Tis of Thee in school. We sang that in school. We said the Pledge of Allegiance in school, and we prayed in school. Amen. So, right. This morning I want to share with you one verse. It says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal our land. This morning I think prayer is needed more in our country than ever before. So this morning I'm going to ask you to stand and sing, and we're going to sing some patriotic songs, hopefully that will stir your heart and remind you of the love you have for this country. America the Beautiful, would you please stand and sing? <laughs>
Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you, Brother Martin. That's Wanda and Leslie and choir and church singing out those wonderful patriotic hymns today. What a, what a blessing that is and what a blessing it is to have the freedom to do that. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to take your Bible and go with me again to the book of Judges, chapter 16. We actually will come to the, the last message in the series. I've been calling Unlikely Heroes, just taking a look at some of the individuals that God used to do extraordinary things, which shows us that God can still use you and me today to do great things in his kingdom work, regardless of our talents, because it's not about our ability, but rather our availability and willingness to trust and obey God and just commit to be faithful in our calling from God. Next week, Lord willing, I'll be preaching a special message as we'll partake of the Lord's Supper together, and then following that, uh, in the weeks ahead, I'll be preaching a new series of messages that I pray will be a blessing to you as much as it is a blessing to me in the years of study and preparation, getting ready just to preach the Word of God and what hopes to reach a lost soul for the, with the gospel, as well as to encourage and challenge a Christian to grow stronger in the faith. And so keep in mind that the Old Testament book of Judges is really a historical book. It covers a chaotic time in Israel's history between the death of Joshua and the beginning of a centralized government that started under King Saul. And so before Israel had their first king, there was about a 300-year period of time that the people of Israel didn't have a king, and so they did what was right in their own eyes, not what was right in God's eyes, and it, got, and it led them into big trouble with God. And so God would raise up these judges. These were military-type leaders to deliver his people from their enemies. There are 12 judges in the book of Judges mentioned by name. Some are more popular than others. Some have more detail given to us than others. Uh, like, for example, Deborah that we learned about in chapters 4 and 5, Gideon in chapters 6 through 8. And today we're going to be looking at Samson. His story is covered in chapters 13 through 16. The other nine judges that God used was Ophniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Tolar, Jair, and Jephthah, which we looked at Jephthah last week. And then there's Ibsen and Elon and Abdon. Judges can be divided into three categories. And I'll give you an outline today to give you helps in your Bible study. In the first division, it shows us the deterioration of Israel, how, how Israel got into the trouble that they got into. And then the next division is the deliverance, when God would raise up those judges that God would use to deliver them during that 300-year period of time. And then chapter 17 to the end of the book, really just shows us Israel's continued cycle of failure, idolatry, moral failure, and just flat out being disobedient to God in spite of knowing better. And it just shows you the, the, the cycle you can get into when you drift away from God. And that should really be a wake-up call for our own country. So let's read now in Judges 16, starting with verse 15, and we'll follow the reading of God's holy, inspired, and errant, infallible word with prayer. And today I'm preaching on a great subject, another chance, which obviously, because of God's grace that we studied about last week, we see that God is a God of another chance. And I say praise his holy name for that truth. So Judges chapter 16, verse 15, then she, this is Delilah, said to him, Samson, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death, that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's wound. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before as other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters 
and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after he had been shaven. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them, and they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, Let me fill the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof, watching Samson perform. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once. O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple. And he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. And the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Estel in the tomb of his father Manoah. He had judged Israel for 20 years. Let us pray. God, our Father in heaven, Lord, I ask again for a fresh touch and fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to empower me to preach your word of truth, Lord, with boldness, with clarity of speech, as I decrease and you increase. It's not about me, it's not about us, it's all about you, Lord. And Lord, we want your Holy Spirit to move freely in here. We pray you bind the devil and any demon spirit that tries to cause any type of distractions, tries to cause anyone in here to lose focus. Lord, we want them to hear from you. We want hearts to be tenderized and ready, Lord, to hear your call during the time of invitation so that any decisions that need to be made today, Lord, will be made according to your plan today. We know no one's under this building today by accident. Your, your sovereign will brought everyone here today for this particular message. So we just want your will to be done, your power and your glory to come down from heaven and fill our very soul in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, Samson is obviously one of the more familiar people in the Bible. There are people who are not even familiar with the Bible that are usually familiar with the story of Samson, the strongest man who ever lived in that day. He did extraordinary things to show off his supernatural strength. In Judges chapter 14, we learn Samson tore a line apart with his bare hands. In Judges 15, he took the fresh jawbone of a donkey and he took out 1,000 men, the Philistines, which was a very fierce enemy that day, he took them out with one jawbone of a donkey. And then in chapter 16, 3, Samson carried the gates of Gaza for 38 miles. He went to Gaza, lifted the very gates out of their foundation, off their hinges, and marched right up those, uh, uh, that mountain, carrying them, uh, them gates on his shoulders like they were toothpicks. That was a 38-mile trip. So obviously a massive, strong man. Well, a while back, there was a news story that hit the news. As they were talking about the 300 whales that were found marooned on a beach. And the only thing scientists can come up with about that mystery was that the whales must have been chasing sardines and got trapped in the shallow waters when the tide went out. Well, unfortunately, for the most of Samson's life, he was chasing sardines. He had great power given to him by God, but he pursued small goals. And in the end, we see him beached. Samson had a great start in life, a great potential, but a very sad finish because he made the choice to dishonor his parents. He deserted the promise. He deserted his purpose. He defiled his purity. He diluted his power. He disgraced his profession and ultimately, because of his own choices, he diminished his potential. He was overcome by three things, and the three things that overcame Samson are the same three things that can overcome any of us today if we let our guard down. First of all, Samson was overcome by the power of Satan. 
the power of Satan. I want you to understand that Satan is very powerful. He's not more powerful than God, but he's very powerful. And I want you to know Satan is always your enemy. He is never your friend. And the Bible tells us that we, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and power. That includes the devil and, and the darkness of evil. So I want you to understand that when it comes to Satan's power, that first of all, Satan is very perceptive. Satan is very perceptive. He knows exactly what your weaknesses are, and that is where he's going to try to trip you up. Now, Samson had a very big weakness. In verse 15, we learned about this woman named Delilah. When you study Samson's life, you can see women was his weakness. In fact, in chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says, Samson went down to Timnah, saw a woman of Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So Samson was fixing his eyes on a woman who wasn't even a believer, a woman who worshiped false gods. I mean, she wasn't even saved. She wasn't even a, a Christian. And the Bible warns believers not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And the best way not to marry an unbeliever is not to ever date one. Christian singles, if you're looking for a date, you should be only be willing to date someone who's truly born again, not just by what they say, but how they live their life. So their lifestyle bears witness that they are truly a born again child of God. Here was a man whose weakness was lust. And Satan knew exactly where he could go to neutralize his life, to destroy his witness, to bring him down to a low place in his life where God would no longer use him. So let me tell you something else about the devil and his power. Not only is Satan perceptive, but he's very persistent. Satan is persistent. I mean, think about it. Satan is so bold and so bad, he came against the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil tempted Jesus himself, not just once, but three times that the Bible records for us. And the Bible teaches us after the Lord rebuked him with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, one of the gospel writers said that Satan went away to come back at a more convenient season, which means if the devil will tempt Jesus, who's holy and perfect multiple times, then certainly he's going to tempt you and me, who are not where, we're nowhere close to being perfect in any way, shape, or form. So always be aware of the tempter. Well, notice what the scripture says, what Samson was going through. Verse 16 says that this lady pestered him daily. So every day, Satan was using this woman, Delilah, uh, a woman that Samson shouldn't have been with to begin with, um, but she, he was using her to tempt him to fail. Samson was with the wrong person, in the wrong place, doing the wrong things, which is a very dangerous slope to disaster for any Christian to ever get on. So don't forget, Satan's perceptive. He knows your weakness. That's where he's going to hit you the hardest. Satan's very persistent. He'll keep on coming back, chipping away, try to break you down. But also, Satan is very prepared. He is prepared. Did you notice how when the Philistines came to Lalala and she told him, you know, I found the secret of his strength. So this is how you can overcome him. Verse 18 says, when Delilah saw that Samson had told her all his heart, she, sent, she called for the lords of the Philistines, come up. Once more, he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came to her and brought the money in their hands. So the Philistines paid her to find out the secret to Samson's strength. And this is what the devil is going to do to you. The devil will organize. He'll finance the plan and staff it with his people to bring you down. That's why you have to be very careful of the crowd you choose to hang out with. Satan loves for a Christian to get involved with the wrong people, doing the wrong things, and definitely being in the wrong places. So Samson was overcome by the power of Satan. The second thing that overcame Samson, which can also overcome us, us at least is very susceptible to the devil's attacks, and that was number two, Samson was overcome by the power of self. The power of self. Now remember, our great, besides our great enemy, the devil himself, the Bible says we all struggle daily with three main enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you receive a brand new nature. You are raised from the dead, the Bible says. That means you were, you were raised from being dead in trespasses of sin to become a new person in Christ. So in Christ, you have a brand new spirit nature. But you still have the flesh nature that you were born with. That's why there is a battle between the flesh and the spirit Every single day, they, they are opposite each other. We still live in these mortal bodies that are fallen. And so, 
self, the flesh nature, wants to control us. That's why we have to be filled with the Spirit every day so that we're not controlled by the flesh. Uh, here's a man who was dominated by the self. He was dominated by the flesh. He wasn't able to exercise self-control over the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three main areas that the devil will seek to bring you down. The Apostle Paul teaches us that we as believers are to reckon ourselves to be dead to sin once we are saved. That means don't let self rule over you. Appropriate who you are in Christ by faith. And you have to remind yourself every day, look, I'm not who I used to be. I'm a new person in Christ. I'm dead to the old life of sin. So therefore, I, ha I can resist the devil. I can flee temptation. You can choose to do the right things. But if you make provisions for your flesh to stumble, you're going to fail. Our flesh is just simply too weak when it comes to sinful temptation. So you have to learn how to feed your new spirit nature, feed your soul. You, you feed your spiritual inner man with the Word of God. That's why it's so important not only for you to, to be in church to be fed the Word of God, but even in your private Bible study to feed from the bread of life. And then you count yourself to be dead to sin. You count yourself to be alive by faith in Christ as you feed from the Word of God. And by doing that, your soul just gets you stronger and stronger and the influence of self will get weaker and weaker. And that's what enables you to resist the devil and flee temptation, which we're taught to do as Christians every single day. If you don't resist, if you don't flee, you're going to fail. Here was a man who literally allowed self to dominate him. He reveals to Delilah the secret of his power in his long hair, he says. Now you need to understand about that because it's not some superstitious thing like if we just cut his hair, then he's going to lose the power of God automatically. The hair of Samson being that length was an outward evidence that something happened to Samson at his birth. There was a holy vow that had been taken concerning his life. And he explained it to Delilah. According to verse 17 of chapter 16, he told her all his heart and said, No razor has ever come upon my head. I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's wound. If I am shaven, then my strength will lead me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now the Nazarite vow is taught to us in Numbers chapter 6. And a Nazarite vow speaks of someone being totally, totally holy and dedicated to the Lord. A Nazarite was forbidden to go near a dead body. A Nazarite could not have any type of intoxicating drink. And according to the word of God, a Nazarite would not have any razor touch the hair of their head. So we have to wonder what is the application of all that. Well, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, who were also ruled by self, they were saved. But unfortunately, they were very immature in the faith and they were living by their self-nature in control. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 is writing to try to correct them, to help them do better. He reached back to the Old Testament and began to draw some examples from the nation of Israel and begin to compare what the church at Corinth was going through to what the children of Israel did back then and the, the consequences of the choices they made back in the wilderness wanderings. And he made a statement. He said that those, those Old Testament happenings is like an example to us. There's a great Bible teacher who's now in heaven. Now in heaven. I used to love listening to him years ago. He sits down at a pastor's conference down in Jacksonville. And uh, he said the Old Testament is like a picture book. It illustrates all the great doctrines of the New Testament. And so we have these great doctrines in the New Testament that teach us how we're to live as Christians, not only how to be saved, but how to live the Christian life. But when you put them together with the teachings of the Old Testament, the Old Testament in a very visual, dramatic way illustrates the things that are taught to us in the New Testament. Now last week I was preaching about Jephthah. And I told you about a promise he made to God, which he didn't have to make and he should not have made. And it put him in a very bad position with his one... And only daughter. If you missed that message, you can view it anytime on our YouTube channel or Facebook. But I'm just going to give you a quick update. Jephthah was another one of the judges that God used to deliver Israel. But he made a vow to God. He said, if you let me win this battle over my enemies, when I get home, the first thing that comes out of my house, I'll offer to you as a sacrifice. 
And we know God had already promised Jephthah the victory. So when Jephthah got the victory, when he got home, the first thing that came out of his house was his one and only daughter. Now some folks have taken that, that Jephthah must have had to kill his own daughter. But I don't believe he killed his daughter. I believe just like Abraham stopped, uh, I mean, God stopped Abraham from slaying his son Isaac on the altar. I don't think God let Jephthah go through with that foolish promise he made. You say, well, why do you believe that? Well, first, the Bible doesn't say that he killed her. Plus, Jephthah is mentioned in the Hall of Heroes, God's Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11. I mean, Jephthah is given honorable mention, and we know God does not bless, nor does he honor any type of disobedience. In Leviticus chapter 18, God forbids human sacrifices. In Leviticus 20, God condemns human sacrifices. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, as well as chapter 18, God condemns human sacrifices. Plus, I find it interesting, the response from his own daughter when she told him that she needed two months to lament and just be alone. And the scripture says that she did something very unusual. The Bible says in Judges 11, verse 37, uh, she said to her father, let this thing be done to me. Let me alone for two months that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity, my friends and I. Now, I find it interesting that she didn't say, let me bewail my death. Um, so she didn't lament the fact that she was going to have to die due to a rash promise her father made. She lamented her virginity. She lamented the fact that she would never get married. She lamented the fact she would never have any children. You may say, well, Pastor, what do you think happened to Jephthah's daughter? I believe his daughter, after those two months of lamenting, went to the temple. She was presented there, but there she would serve in the temple for the rest of her life. I believe she's one of the serving women that the Bible talks about in Exodus chapter 38. The Bible said, talks about the serving women that always assembled at the door of the tabernacle. It was those same women that Eli's sons in 1 Samuel got in trouble while they took advantage of those women that were always serving at the tabernacle. They were always involved in the ministry of service for the Lord. And so Jephthah's daughter would have to spend the rest of her life serving in the tabernacle, never marrying, never having any children. So therefore she lamented her virginity, not her death. You may say, well, what does she illustrate then to us in the New Testament? She illustrates Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, that we're not supposed to be conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind, and we're to present our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. Keep in mind, Jephthah was not the only parent who would dedicate one of his children to that kind of service in the tabernacle. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1, we learn about a woman named Hannah who was barren and unable to have a child, and she prayed to God, God, if you'll just give me a baby boy, I would dedicate him to you, and he'll be yours all the years of his life. No razor shall touch his head. He will be a Nazarite. Just give me that baby boy. I promise to dedicate him to service in your tabernacle all the years of his life. And the Bible teaches after Samuel was weaned as a child, she took him to the tabernacle where he did serve the Lord the rest of his life, having made that Nazarite vow. So I just believe the daughter of Jephthah is an Old Testament example of a living sacrifice that Romans teaches about serving the Lord, holy, acceptable to the Lord the rest of the days of our life. And today it's very clear the Bible teaches us to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, totally surrendered to the Lord, to serve the Lord with gladness all the days of our life. The scripture is clear in that. So what does the Nazarite vow have to do with a Christian believer today? Well, the Nazarite vow is really was just understanding what Numbers chapter 6 teaches us. In verse 8 it says, All the days of his separation shall be holy to the Lord. There's no exceptions to that. A Nazarite vow was an illustration of holiness in the life of a Christian to be separate from the world, to set apart to God. God said without holiness, we cannot see the Lord. The word holy, the word sanctified, the word sanctification, the word saint in the New Testament all come from the same Greek word that means to be set apart. There's a negative and a positive aspect to that. The negative, we're set apart from sin by the Holy Spirit. The positive, we're set apart to God for his exclusive use. 
So the Holy Spirit of God, who is in us once we get saved, takes the Word of God, and He begins to shape our actions, our attitude, and our words, our conduct, and more and more into the likeness of Jesus as we grow in the faith. And that is a lifelong process. Our position is holy. The moment you get saved, God has declared you righteous in Christ. He declares you set apart from the world and declares you holy to God. Sanctification is the Holy Spirit in you, working through you, causing your daily practice to line up with your position in Christ. And like I said, you will experience that process for the rest of your life as a Christian. Because we're justified, we're being sanctified, and one of these days we shall be glorified in Romans chapter 8. That's a done deal in God's eyes. But the Bible says a Nazarite could not go near a dead body. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And when you get saved, you're supposed to walk in holiness, which means you're not supposed to go back to the dead places in your past, to do the dead things of your past. You're not supposed to play with sin because sin is deadly. You, you have been set apart from sin. That means you are free from sin, not free to sin. There's a big difference. You're supposed to be holy to the Lord. The Bible says a Nazarite was not to drink any type of intoxicating drink. They were not to be a drunkard at all. That means their appetites and their desires their, in every way was to be holy and dedicated under control of the Holy Spirit because they were not supposed to defile their body in any way. Remember, your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit of God. These people who say, this is my body, I can do what I want to with it, they have not read the Scriptures. If you belong to the Lord, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. The Holy Spirit lives in you. You belong to God. And you'll answer to God how you live your life. The Bible says a razor was not to touch their head, so that obviously they had long hair. And that was really an outward profession that they had made their Nazarite vow to be totally set apart to God. So Samson revealed the secret that his head shaven, the enemy would overcome him because he'd be weak like any other man. So he was illustrating in his life in a very dramatic way that even though he had a confession and profession of a Nazarite, he was confessing his faith by his mouth but outwardly by his long hair, but sadly, inwardly in his heart, he wasn't committed to God. It was all lip service. His weakness was really not about his hair. It was about his heart. When his head was shaven, it revealed that he was a man dominated by self. He never was totally surrendered to the Lord. That's why he was void and empty of the power of God because if there's no holiness in you, there's not going to be any power of God in your life to work in and through your life. It's just that simple. You may say, oh, I would love for God to demonstrate his power in my life. Just understand, God will not demonstrate his power in an unholy vessel. You cannot, especially as a born-again Christian, you cannot live in sin and expect to receive God's blessings. It just don't work. Here was a man dominated by self. Here is a man who kept the rules outwardly, but his heart was never devoted to God. But let me tell you something about self. Self will dominate you. It'll control you. And self will deplete you. That's the two things that you've got to be careful about self. Here's a man, chapter 16, verse 20, that's going to try to handle things in his own way. He thinks he's calling the shots like he's always done. Verse 20, Delilah said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he woke from his sleep and he said, I'll go out as before, as other times, and shake myself free. He said, I'll do this. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. What a sad picture we have here. That teaches us self-effort is no substitute for the power of God. Natural abilities is never a substitute for God's activity in a believer's life. Here's a man who could conquer others, but he couldn't conquer himself. I mean, he had set the Philistines' fields on fire, but he couldn't control the fire of lust that burned within his own soul. He killed a lion with his bare hands, but he couldn't crucify his own flesh. He could at one time break the bonds of men. Nothing could hold Samson down, but he couldn't shake off the shackles of sin that began to gradually hold him tighter and tighter till he was overcome by the power of Satan, overcome by the power of self, and then number three, grossly overcome by the power of sin. The power of sin. Verse 21, we see the effects of sin in a believer that loses their way. And this could happen to any of us. 
A lot of believers struggle with this because they still try to, they want to say they love God, but they still want to play with sin. And the power of sin on a weak flesh indicates that person is not totally surrendered to God. This is the way Samson had lived his life. He basically took God and God's blessing of supernatural strength for granted. And for him, it was just about pleasing himself. It's about instant gratification. He never thought about the consequences of his decisions. He never thought about the fact that the Bible teaches sin can be pleasurable for a season, but that season will end. Then comes the regret, the pain, the consequences of sin sometimes can be long-lasting and even to the point of death. Samson never asked God to help him do the right thing. He never prayed. He didn't seek the wisdom of godly people. He was just bound and determined to do what he wanted to do regardless of what anybody else said. Even when his own parents, who loved him, godly parents, he was blessed to be raised in a godly home. They tried to give him good godly counsel and warned him about being involved with ungodly women. He refused to listen. He said, I'm going to call the shots of my life. I'm going to make my own decisions. I'm going to live my life my way. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. And sometimes you may hear people say, you know, you just need to follow your heart. And I know people mean well when they say that, but I'm going to tell you in love, don't do that. Unless you know your heart's right with God. Because if your heart's not right with God, I'm going to tell you your heart will lead you wrong. Your heart will take you on a dark road of decline. If your heart is being controlled by the lust of the flesh and not the convicting, convincing, discerning power of the Holy Spirit, if your heart is being controlled by the flesh, your heart don't know where you're headed. Your heart will lead you the wrong way. That's why you want to make sure every day you surrender your all to follow Jesus with all your heart. Trust him and his word to guide you, to give you wisdom, to make good, God-honoring decisions. Don't trust self. Well, Samson makes all these bad decisions. So he chooses to do things his way. So now we see the results and the power of sin. He lost the power of God in his life. Now he's a captive of the Philistines. He's being treated like a farm animal. So here we see the results of the power of sin. First of all, notice the blinding results of sin, the blinding results. The first thing they did to Samson, according to verse, they gouged his eyes out. They blinded him. And do you realize sin blinds a person to the truth, the only truth that can set you free? And so to choose to live in sin is choosing to live in darkness of sin that leads to bondage, not freedom. That brings us not only to the blinding results of sin, but also the binding results to binding. They put fetters on him. They chained him to hold him in check. Now, he was already a slave to sin. Now we see a picture of it. Here's a man who chose to do things that was right in his own eyes. His own sight. And now he has no sight at all. The blinding results of sin, Samson lost his eyesight. The binding results of sin, he's now in bondage. He's shackled in chains. The sin that once bought him so much pleasure that he thought is now his slave master. And that's what sin will do to you and me if we choose to go down that path. Sin will always take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. In this case, Samson lost his eyesight. He lost his freedom because of Satan, self, and sin. But then we see another thing about the power of sin. We see the grinding results of sin, the grinding. Now as a prisoner, Samson's grinding away like an ox, like a, like a farm animal. He's pushing a wheel that grinds grain. Every day he's going in circles, performing for his enemies, as a prisoner living in darkness. What a sad way for him to have to end his life. For the first time in his life now, he's hit a brick wall that he can't break his way through. And sadly, there's a lot of believers today because of terrible, bad choices. They live in prisons of broken homes, wasted health, very unhappy lives, which are the results of making bad choices over and over. And bad choices can have long-lasting, devastating consequences. And if I stop the sermon right here, if I stopped it here, and I offer the invitation here, if I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, if I did it right now, that would be a very depressing way to bring this message to a close. But praise God it don't stop there. Verse 22. However, 
However, while he's grinding at the mill, now remember, Samson's chained. They gouged his eyes out. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after he had been shaven. I want you to know if you've made some bad choices in your life, you've made some bad decisions that you deeply regret, you wish you hadn't have made, I want you to understand it doesn't matter. If you go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness, God will forgive you. He will forgive you of any sin. And God's forgiveness is instant. It's immediate. But you have to receive it. You have to acknowledge that you have been forgiven by God, and then you have to forgive yourself. You can't live the rest of your life on regrets, beating yourself up for things in your past, saying, oh, I wish I hadn't have done that. I wish I hadn't have made that decision. I wouldn't be in this situation. It's too late. Once you've done something, you made it. It's in the past. There's nothing any of us can do to change the past. But you don't have to live in the past. You don't have to spend the rest of your life reliving the bad choices and bad decisions you may have made and stay in a self-pity pit, soaking in misery and regret. You don't have to live that way. You've got to receive the forgiveness of God by believing in His promise. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means everything. God can wipe your slate clean as if you've never sinned. That's why you've got to forgive yourself. Learn to put past mistakes behind you. Don't repeat them. So just understand, God's forgiveness is instant. And you need to forgive yourself and put it in the past, but you need to understand that healing and restoration does take time. The Bible says, however, the hair of his head began to grow. Again, that was a gradual process. It wasn't a light switch. Samson's hair did not grow back to full length overnight. It took time for his hair to grow back. And during that time, Samson was able to do some soul searching and get his heart right with God. Samson didn't get in that situation overnight. He had a lifelong pattern from his childhood to adulthood of making ungodly, unwise decisions that finally caught up to him. And I want you to understand that significant failure, being in a backslidden condition, is never caused by a split-second decision at one moment. To be totally backslidden in your relationship to God involves a lot of bad decisions where you make wrong choices and you get on a downward path and you, and you don't repent. You, you don't seek the Lord to help you. You stay on that downward path until you hit rock bottom. And then you're forced to look up and ask God for help or you give up. The healing process, which is a long process, Old habits have to be unlearned and they have to be replaced with good habits. And in that process, you have to learn to be patient, patient with yourself and patient with others because restoring you to be more spiritually healthy in your life after consequences of bad choices does take time. But God will take you through that process. It's known as sanctification. It's a lifelong process from the moment you get saved to the moment you're taken to heaven. And during that process, God will sift you, he'll stretch you, and he'll help you learn. He'll help you unlearn the bad habits, and he'll help you learn the new lessons that can help you make better decisions in life. That way, when the temptation comes again, you can say, oh, no, I've been there, done that, I'm not doing that again. So please understand, forgiveness from God is immediate, but restoration takes time. So does that hurt you have? It takes time to heal from that. And there are some consequences to forgiving sins. You may have to live with the rest of your life because of sinful choice you made. That's just a fact of life. You take someone who lets their guard down and they get intoxicated and they drive their vehicle and they get involved in a very serious accident that causes them great bodily harm or they may lose a limb or even worse, take some innocent person's life. And even though that person can be forgiven of that sin, they still have to live with the consequences of that long-lasting injury or worse, the conscience of knowing that they killed someone in a wreck. So with the painful, regretful decisions scarring your life, you still have a choice. You can sit around and you can blame God. You can blame someone else. You can be bitter. Or you can take responsibility and move forward. You can accept God's forgiveness. And accept the fact that he'll give you a fresh start. He'll give you another chance. God wants you to put the past behind you. He just wants you to learn from it and move on and live a better life that honors God 
instead of dishonoring God. You have that choice. Everybody has that choice. Here, I don't see this man Samson wallowing in self-pity. I don't see him blaming God. Samson knew he got his own self in that big mess by his own sinful choices and disobedience to God. So yes, he was forgiven instantly. And yes, his hair began to grow back, but he never got his eyesight back. Remember, they gouged his eyes out. They blinded him. The consequences of him losing his eyesight, he had to live with the rest of his life, even though his hair did begin to grow back. He got his life right with God before it was too late. And Christian, when you make the decision in your life, you need to understand that all decisions have consequences. And even though the Lord Jesus can forgive you of any type of sin, there's not a sin out there he can't forgive you for, the scars that you bring in your life, the pain that you bring in your life, the consequences resulting from the sin that you choose to be involved in, you may have to deal with those consequences the rest of your life. But here's the good news. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I want you to know God's grace is always sufficient for you to rise above the scars of forgiven sin because you can choose to do better from this point on. And so here's something very important. When God gives you another chance, you better make the most of it because it might be your last chance. The Bible teaches us in 1 John 5 verse 10, I mean verse 16, that there is a sin that leads to death. There's sometimes believers who get on that downward path. They, get, they can't seem to, to break their addiction. They die a premature death because that's the only way for God to get them out of their bondage and misery. God gives you another chance. God gives you another day to live. You better make the most of it because it could be your last chance. Here we see Samson's hair is growing back. And I just believe when his hair started growing back, it was a revelation of what was really happening in his heart. Samson had a long time to think about what he had done and what he needed to do as he was grinding at that mill like an ox. His heart began to turn back to the Lord. And until then, he didn't really think much about God. It was all lip service. It was all about himself. But notice the change in verse 28. Samson called to the Lord, saying, Oh, Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once. Oh, God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines from my two eyes. Samson turned his heart to God, and he prayed, Oh, God in heaven, I'm just asking for another chance. Give me one more chance, God, and I'll make it right. I'm not going to blow it. I'm going to make the most of it. And he asked this young man who was guiding Samson. Remember, he was blind. So he said, put my hands on those pillars that hold this vast temple. This, and remember, that was the temple of the false god, Dagon. And the Bible says that 3,000 of the lords of the Philistines had gathered there. That's the rulers of the Philistines. And Samson put his, one, put his right hand on one pillar, his left hand on the other pillar. And basically, he prayed, oh God, one more time, may your power course through me so I can do this for your glory. I want you to have the victory. I want, to, I want to honor the holiness of your name. These people have defiled your name. They're giving praise to their false God. And you could take my life with these folks, all these folks who have cursed you and dishonored you. You let me do this and take my life with them. The Bible says the power of God coursed through Samson. He pushed those pillars with all his might. And that building totally collapsed. And in that moment, the Bible says he took out more Philistines in his death than he ever did when he was alive. Verse 31 says, His brothers and his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zor and Estol in the tomb of his father, Manoah. And so Samson's family, who once feared the Philistines, didn't seem like they were scared anymore. They rushed right in there, got Samson's body, and took him back home to the family cemetery. Now, why were they able to go and get Samson's body in this enemy territory? Because there was nobody left standing in the temple to oppose them. And anybody that was outside the temple, they decided they're decided they not going to mess with them. Because they saw that Dagon, their false god, had no power. They saw firsthand that Jehovah God, 
Samson God is the real God. He's the God of power. And they made the choice, we're not going to mess with God or God's people anymore. So the fact that God answered Samson's prayer in the end indicates Samson obviously made things right with God before it was too late. Psalm 66, verse 18 and 19 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. God heard Samson's prayer and God answered it. They buried Samson in the tomb of his father. So now he's back home where he started. But he's dead. Now I told you in the beginning of the message, he had a great start in life. Godly parents. God blessed him with supernatural strength, spiritually, physically, mentally. He had, I mean, he had so much potential, but he blew it. And it all started when he disagreed and dishonored his own parents about marrying a Philistine girl that he was lusting for. He dishonored his own Nazarite vow. He basically defiled himself by choosing to make wrong choices, going with wrong people in the wrong places. He disregarded the warnings of God. He continued to disobey God, and he was ultimately defeated by the enemies of God. I can only imagine, just before he made things right, I'm sure he was thinking that, you know, he once chose to do anything he wanted to do. He thought that Nazarite vow given to him at birth just gave him right to do anything he wanted to do, even though he won a lot of victories for God's people, especially from the Philistines who scared God's people to death. But he chose to compromise. He chose to let his guard down. He chose to willfully sin again and again against God, against his own body, and it cost him dearly. He lost his eyesight. He lost his freedom. And he lost his life. And I just believe King Solomon was thinking about Samson when he wrote in Proverbs 25, 28, whoever has no rule over their own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. In Proverbs 16, 32, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. And so in closing, let me tell you, the same power that coursed through Samson is in you today through the person of the Holy Spirit if you're saved. That means in Christ you are more than a conqueror. If Christ is in you, then you have someone in you who is greater and more powerful than Samson ever was. And I want you to know when Jesus died on that cross, he didn't die so that others may die. He died so that sinners might live. The Bible says in verse 28, Oh God, remember me, I pray. Samson said, when he prayed that, God remembered him, answered his prayer, and then the Bible says Samson died. Well, I read about another man in the Gospel of Luke who prayed at the last minute. He still died, but had some good news. Convicted thief, hanging on a cross by Jesus, got under Holy Spirit conviction. God has given him another chance, but it was his last chance. And thankfully, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to the dying thief, today you shall be with me in paradise. That means he was instantly forgiven. He still experienced a physical death, but his spirit immediately went to be with the Lord. And the story of Samson does not end with a note of failure. It actually ends with a note of faith. Because in the Word of God, in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 to 33, God's Hall of Faith chapter, the Bible says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, also David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith, not failure, through faith, subdued kingdoms. Samson prayed and was forgiven by God. God put Samson in the Hall of Faith chapter, not because he deserved it, but because God is a God of grace. I praise God that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ not only forgives us and restores us, but gives us another chance. If you're here today and you've blown it for whatever, if you're ashamed of your past, I want to tell you it's not too late. It is not too late to get a fresh start and new beginning. It's your choice. Just don't blow it. Trust God and trust Him to give you that, that, that new chance 
to make things right. And by you being here today, God's given you that chance. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. As I plead the blood of Jesus over every pew, every heart, that any decision that needs to be made, hearts about to come out of their chests, will respond to your call on the very first verse. We just want your way to be done, your will, and you get all the glory in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you.